and again, they're talking about flooding, you know, upper Mississippi this year, crazy rain events in the last couple of years, flooding in Pakistan, flooding in Queensland, flooding in Ohio already this spring uh, that's reaching record levels. So I've been thinking a lot about water. So my specialty is actually green building. Um, I'm a lead consultant. And so what I do with 95% of my time is help commercial projects get LEED certified. Does everyone know what LEED is? Martha Norbeck. Okay. It's a green building rating system. And it looks at energy, water, site materials. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. So one of the issues I do look at a lot is, is stormwater. And one of my frustrations working on with all three universities in the state is that even though um, I, the ISU and UI have suffered some major flooding, they have nothing in place to deal with it. And on their new construction projects, they have no requirements for stormwater management. And so this distresses me a little bit. <laughs> and it's hey for us to finally wake up and go, huh, gee, climate change really is happening. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of where I got come, came to the, to, to the water issue. And so part of the, so the question is, what does this have to do with renewable energy? Because this is the I Renew Expo. And to me, it's, it's actually pretty closely linked because, first of all, one of the reasons we're worried about renewable energy is because, um, well, we, we care about it because it's really fun. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, but it's also combating climate change by using renewable energy. Um, and then the third reason why a lot of people get involved in renewable energy is security, because our infrastructure is incredibly fragile. Uh, power lines go down, people are out of, uh, you know, out of power for a week, and they, you know, people freak out, can't function. Um, but in 2008, they were talking about the Iowa water plant. They were sandbagging the Iowa water plant. Have we run out of Iowa uh, water? Had no fresh drinking water? I mean, that's a lot more chaos than getting power lines down. Um, when, when you look at issues of security, um, water is a much bigger security issue than energy. Because we could function without the energy, we just don't like to. Um, and it does, because we're so dependent on the energy, it's hard to function normally. But if we don't have clean water to drink, that's it, we're dead. You know, it, it's a fundamental security issue. And then we're actually going to look specifically at locally, what is our watershed, what is a watershed, um, and how, how we find out more about it. Um, and then we're going to do an exercise where we're actually going to take some aerial photos and look at water in the landscape in, in the Iowa City region and sort of have a discussion about what, what, how things could be different. You know, we have a lot of people talking about, you know, well, if we start from scratch and design this miracle city, it'll be like this. Well, we're not going to do that. It's not practical. I've seen those, those visions fall flat because that's not how things evolve. We evolve communities over time. If you try and just plop a city down, um, every time people have tried to do that, it's kind of failed. It's, it's kind of an organic evolution. Of, of cities and the problem was we got that city we got so how do we function within our watershed to improve it so that's that's the fun part is drawing on that stuff. Um, a little background. Um, so this is what I think about when I think about the floods of 2008 and the fact that these guys are surrounded by water and yet they can't drink that water. So just because you have water doesn't mean you have water to drink. And so water security is not just the presence of water. So we say, oh, well, we get 32 inches of rain in Iowa a year, so we've got enough water. We're not like Las Vegas that gets five inches. They really, you know, they have a, an absence of water, but here is plenty of water, but no water security. Um, oh, I have to look at my notes here. Uh, so. In, since the 1950s, our world population has doubled and our water use has tripled. So we're already on the same trajectory with water usage kind of as we are for energy. So that's a concern. 
And then in the U.S., 70% of our water is actually used for agriculture. And in the Midwest, we think, oh, well, we don't irrigate that much in Iowa, but we're using lots of water for processing. It uses lots of water to turn corn into corn syrup. It uses lots of water to create ethanol. It uses lots of water to produce cornflake. Um, all of these food processing is part of that 70% of the water for agriculture. Um, and then 20% is for industry, and only 10% of the drinking water that we use is actually for domestic usage. And of that 10% we use for domestic usage, we're actually using 40% of that to water our lawns, which most people put too many chemicals on. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And the, one of the other issues is that since uh, over a billion people live in places where there's not enough water, where there physically is not enough water, those billion people, as, the, as we get more extreme rain events, and you get an increasing disparity of who has water and who doesn't, where are these people going to move? I mean, right now they're moving to Las Vegas because you artificially are creating water availability by draining the Colorado River. But once that stops, where are those people going to go? So that's another security issue of what happens as water, as water issues become more of of a political issue. And LA has 15 inches of water, but if anyone's been to LA lately, they certainly don't live like they have 15 inches of water a year because they're basically artificially creating a tropical environment where it really is a desert environment. And eventually that, that fantasy is going to collapse. <laughs> so um, this is a concern because what, what is going to happen to those folks? You know, are we going to have a remigration in the mid Midwest if, if they, you know, things finally, the water festival in, in California collapses? So this is a concern. Um, I have one other piece of information here that I wanted to tell you. Oh, yes. Um, in February of this year, uh, Nature released a study that was sort of mind-boggling. They basically said they ran all the climate models and our extreme rain events that have been occurring using, without introducing climate change into the model, that the rain events that we're experiencing cannot be happening. The only thing to explain the rain events is climate change. And there have been, um, uh, in the 90s, rain and snow events were 7% wetter um, than they were in the 1950s. And that's in a 40 year period. And part of the reason for that is as the atmosphere is warmer, it holds more water, which allows for more water to dump down um, in deluges. So they had 15 inches of water in four days in a Missouri city uh, just last week. We get 32 inches of water a year, and so does Missouri. And they got 15 inches in four days. They got half of their year, a year's water in four days. Their, their landscape is not set up to manage that. And that's when you get flooding and major, major damage, which, again, is dealing with security. So this is why, one of the reasons that water has been fascinating me. So that's sort of the background. And then now I want to talk about um, getting into what a watershed is. Uh, does anyone know what a watershed is? Every inch of the planet is in a watershed. And in the U.S., there's 2,000 different registered watersheds. And basically, if you look at a topography map, you can see the ridges where your drainage pattern changes. So this dark red line represents the entire watershed, the drainage area, to this body of water. And then at the peak, at this ridge, it goes into another watershed. And so all this water is your water, one watershed. So the official definitions that I picked up for that are uh, <laughs> the area of land where all water that is under it or on it drains off and goes into the same place, which in our circumstance is the Mississippi River. Um, a high ridge of land dividing two areas that are drained by different systems. And high ridge in Iowa may only mean, <laughs> you know, 50 feet higher. But 50 feet is enough. Even if you've got a 2% slope, it's still sloping somewhere. And all water runs somewhere. So everyone's in a watershed. 
And so when I look at my watershed, it was actually fascinating to look at the topography because I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm right next to Ralston Creek. But if you look at the topo maps, there's really only four blocks of people whose pesticides I'm really worried about who are draining out of my land before it goes into the creek because there's a little hump there and it goes into another portion of Ralston Creek as it curves. So I'm on this side, and so I just get this little piece, and then the rest goes over to, to my neighbors downhill, <laughs> which I, I was actually glad to know about. So that's a watershed, and that also includes, you know, you have groundwater seeps into rivers and bodies of water, and some are, are contained. So this is the Mississippi wa watershed, so we're looking at sort of the biggest view, and it's it's the fourth largest watershed in, in the world, and it's 1.2 million square miles. And as you can see, it covers most of the United States. So when they talk about flooding on Mississippi, you know, poor Dubuque, Davenport, they're just getting pummeled <laughs> from all directions. And as you get closer to the Gulf, you know, these people are really bearing the brunt of basically the entire Midwest. And so if you look at land use in those areas, everywhere that it's light green is ag. And that's a huge proportion. Dark green is forest, and then we've got a little bit of rangeland in here. But the vast majority, and you look here, there's really not that much urban in comparison to ag land. So we're going to talk a little bit about, definitely going to talk about ag land today and, and its effect on the Gulf. Is anyone familiar with hypoxia? The dead zone in the Gulf? Okay. Um, which is largely created as a result of runoff from that entire cone of the Mississippi, all those pesticides. And we, you know, we yell at farmers, but really, residential, we, we always overapply. And golf courses, terrible, overapply. So you're actually getting more runoff in terms of chemicals per acre from our residential and commercial turf areas than you are from ag land. Because when farmers are doing 3,000 acres, they're going to be really conservative because they, they can't afford not to be. Whereas if you're doing your yard and everyone's doing their yard, you're like, ah, let's put out a little extra. Or I'm not going to really measure. But when you're doing 3,000 acres, you're measuring because it starts to matter. So actually, our residential air and land is really contributing significantly to the chemical load. But the soil load, uh, if we have time, we'll look at a little video here. Has anyone seen the video, Losing Ground? Oh, well, we, we got to see that, because it's amazing. They have come up with a study that documents that in a single rain event in Iowa, they, they documented, I believe it was 100 tons of topsoil loss per acre in one rain event. And they used to say that the average in Iowa was five acres, five tons of soil loss per year per acre. But now they're revising that, saying that it's multiple times greater than that. And it's really, really shocking. So we'll, we'll get to that. So that's the Mississippi. This is the Iowa watershed. And the Iowa River watershed has the upper, middle, and lower Iowa and so when we want to look at just our watershed where we are, it's really the runoff in this zone. But one of the things you'll notice by some of these black outlines is that watersheds don't care where political boundaries are. They don't care where South Dakota ends and Iowa begins. They just want, they're just going where, where the topography goes. So where we are is in the lower Iowa watershed down here. So if we go back here, it's this portion here. And every watershed of this size has an eight-digit, what's called a hydraulic unit code, HUC, 